Settings is the next thing that we're going to be going over here, and it's going to take a little while to do, and I realize that this might be boring to some, but you know what? In order for EDIUS or any program, really, to be perfectly honest, to work correctly and to work the best way for you, you've got to make sure that you know what the settings are and you set them to where it's going to be the most benefit to you. Now, to get to our settings, we just come up to the pull-down menu in our overlay window. I select it with the left mouse button, and the first thing we're going to do is System Settings. Now, once I've opened up system settings, you'll notice that on the left-hand side, I have a tree structure here. And then on the right-hand side, of course, is where all the settings are. Now, we're going to just go down these one at a time. Some of them I'll be uh, talk about a little bit more than others. Some of them I'll just basically be touching on to let you know what they are. Playback. This one I have changed. Number one, I do not check stop playback at frame drop. Now, this kind of goes back to the days uh, when we were using tape. When you were recording back to tape, the last thing you want to do is, if there was just an itty-bitty stutter somewhere because the timeline didn't play something in real time, you didn't want it to stop, and then the tape just keep recording that same frame if you weren't sitting right there watching it the entire time. Basically, now that we've gone file-based, and I know I hardly know of anybody going back to tape anymore, this isn't as important anymore. And when you're editing, if you do hit a couple of rough spots and it skips a little bit, that's fine because I can still see what's going on. My playback buffer size... I need to explain this, and the reason being is, is because there have been a lot of people since the early days of Canopus that still don't quite understand what the buffer is. Once again, back in the days of tape, when we were playing back video and playing back our projects back to tape, there were times when computers weren't that powerful that if you put on a transition of some kind that was a CPU hog, if it was trying to play it at that very moment, that every time it would sit there and, and start to stutter. Now, what the engineers did here was brilliant, to be perfectly honest with you, is that EDIUS will look ahead a certain amount of frames, depending upon the resolution and depending upon how much memory you give it. It looks ahead and builds the project ahead of time. So that if you do hit a transition that would normally cause it to stutter, it won't. Because it will eat the buffer up as it's trying to get through it. And as long as it doesn't reach about two or three on the buffer frames, then it'll play through it smoothly and start to build the buffer back up again. So it really didn't have that much to do with real-time performance per se, but real-time playback when you were going back to tape. It was very, very important. Now, I always set this to 512. That's the highest you can. I mean, if you want to, you can set it for lower. But I've always set it to 512 to get the maximum amount of frames on that buffer. And then it also has a buffered frames before playback. Now, I have it set to 5, but some machines, for some reason, will kind of hesitate at the beginning and almost stutter at the very beginning. And if your machine does that, if it's a little bit older machine, you can take it up to 15 frames. And what it'll do is, is it'll, in memory, build the first 15 frames and play through that so that if your machine has a tendency to do that, it won't. So you have those choices right there. Capture. Margin, guys, is basically just a handle that you have. If you're capturing from tape and you set it in and out and you want to capture between that in and out, what it's going to do is, is that margin is going to decide how much of video is it going to record before your in point and after your out point. So you have a little bit of play there. The default is two seconds. I basically leave it at two seconds, although I know others that like to have a five to ten second one because they like to have a lot of play sitting in there. It's completely and totally up to you. Now, confirm real name setting after uh, setting device preset. A real name is basically if you're coming from a tape or you're coming from a card and, and they're all coming from the same camera and the same shoot, it'll have the same real name or real number so that all those clips are kind of associated with each other. Confirm file name at capture. You can do it either before or after capture. I have it set to before. Load to player after capture. I don't have a reason to do that, so I don't. And then correct audio errors automatically, I go ahead and do that. Now, this is new in 6.5. Set file uh, names for two file capture. This is basically 3D. So as you can see, the suffix L and R for left and, and right eye. So you can set your file names here if you're shooting and, and capturing in 3D. Underneath here is automatic detection of captured events. You have the choice of when you're recording from tape and if there's a time code break, it will create a separate clip or when the aspect ratio changes, or when the sampling rate changes on your audio, or when the recorded time data changes, meaning that inside of that metadata, if it sees that there's even a one second difference between the ending of one shot and the beginning of another on the clock, that it will create a different one. When an event is detected, you can divide the files, and you can group the divided files as a sequence if you want to, or you can just add a marker. 
So you don't have to necessarily separate the files out. You could literally capture it and just have markers be where those events take place so that looking at the clip, you'll know exactly when the shots have changed. Deck control after capture, just after you do a single capture, you want to pause. After you do a batch capture, do you want to pause? Do you want to stop? Nothing, pause or stop. So you have these uh, different options. Underneath render, when you have a clip on the timeline, you'll notice that there are little colored bars that go across it. And orange means, I'm not sure I can play back this in real time. If you see red above it, it's saying, I really don't think I can play this back. In fact, I'm almost sure I can't play it back. Well, if you need to render a small area because you've put a, a bunch of filters on or done something like that, you actually have the ability to speed that rendering up by saying, what do I want to render? Do I want to render just the filters, just transitions, just the speed change, or just the contents that are not project format? I can do all of them, or I can just do one or any combination thereof. And basically what this does is speeds up rendering. If your machine's a pretty powerful machine, you may not need to render all those aspects of it to, to get stuff to play back. Render decisions. Here's that buffer again. When it's fewer than four frames, it's going to put that red above it and sit there and say, you know what, I'm not playing this back in real time. And then you can delete invalid rendered files in case you rendered something out and then you changed it. You can delete those when the rendered file becomes invalid or when the project is closed. Really doesn't matter. I just keep it to when the project is closed. Our next one is profile. Now, remember we talked about profile at the very beginning and how we can set up a profile for each individual person. Now, take a look at this. Underneath profile, you can either do it locally or you can do it on a shared server or you can do it local and a shared server. In a larger production house, TV station, whatever it happens to be, if you pick local and shared server, then what will happen is, is that it'll create the profile on that computer's hard drive, but it'll also create it on the server. Then you can import it from any different machine that's on that server. You can import your profile and you don't have to reset it up again. Now, this is how hard it is to do. Please watch very, very closely. I select new profile. I name it. I can set it as a read-only or a restricted user. I select OK. I am now finished. I'm done. Now when I open EDIUS under that profile, EDIUS is going to open up in its default state. All keyboard shortcuts, buttons, window positions, everything it's going to be is in default state. As I move windows around, as I change keyboard shortcuts, as I change buttons, do all these different things for a user, that's going to be stored. And the first time I go out of EDIUS, it's going to save it to that profile and then every time I open up the computer underneath the profile mic, the computer is going to act the exact way that I set it up to act. That's how hard it is to do. Project preset. Here are my four presets right here. And right now I can copy, I can modify, or I can delete any of these presets. I can go into the preset wizard, but to me the preset wizard was a little bit too much. In fact, a lot of people, they'll just start clicking, oh, I want all SD, I want all HD, I want, and they end up with 500 presets, and, and they're only going to ever use like one or two of them. So basically, when I started the program, I didn't even use the wizard. I came in here and created what I wanted from scratch. And to create a new preset is a very simple process. I hit new preset. I can give it a name, and let's just say DV for standard definition, 4 by 3. Okay, I can select an icon. So I can come in here and select, and I know that I've got one here that says, oh, there's DV right there. So I'll pick DV right there, select OK. And then under video preset, I can make this very simple. I can just come down to standard definition, NTSC, 740 by 480, 4 by 3, and pick it. My audio preset, I want to be at 48 with two channel. My render format over here underneath setup, this just means when I'm doing a, a render on the timeline, what is my temporary file going to be? I always use Canopus standard. That's basically it. And then down here, when you're creating your preset, this is where I always select two V tracks, zero VA tracks. Now, I know that there are people who use VA tracks, and for good reason. But to be honest with you, I don't use them at all because I like to have my audio separated out. I don't use title tracks anymore, so I set that to zero, and then I leave my audio tracks at four. I select OK, and now I have a brand new DV43 preset. So now that every time I open up Adius, that's going to be one of the choices that I have. And then I select OK to come out of that. And I, oh, I jumped completely out of the system and I didn't mean to do that. But that's how you create a preset. And just to delete one is just to highlight and hit the delete one. Loudness meter is brand new. These are two standards, guys, uh, especially in the broadcast area, that will analyze your volume of your clips and be able to help you stay within a certain standard. 
and you can get to this when you're editing by going up to the view pull down menu and pick it and then start to play wherever you're going to be. But these are already set up basically, so we're not going to do anything here. Your source browser, inside your source browser, we're going to be learning how to bring footage in from that. When I bring something in off the original media, I want it to go into the project folder or I can do a custom folder if I want to. Now, I'm not going to do that today, but you have that choice right there. And then create folder with the date if you want to have that. And then, of course, it shows you the path of where you're going to be downloading those files to. Underneath hardware, device preset. Basically, guys, let's say I have a tape deck that has some old stock footage on it or whatever it happens to be. Or if I have one of the Grass Valley solutions like the Edius Elite type thing that I can have HDSDI and HDMI and component and composite connections. I would just come down to new. I would select an icon and I would just name it. Select next. And then this interface is going to be generic OHCI. However, if you had one of the Grass Valley hardware options, that would be listed here too. You have the video format of what you want to be able to bring in. And I was just going to do DV, so all I'm going to do is 720 by 480. What codec I want to be able to use, what file format that I want to be able to use, whether MXF or AVI. My proxy, am I going to do high res only? Since this is a standard definition, I'm not even worried about having a proxy. Audio format, I'm going to leave it on auto detection. And so I have all of this available to me right here. I hit next. And then the output. It's just going to be, once again, generic OHCI. The stream is going to be output. I'm going to be playing back DVC Pro. Actually, I'm not. I'm going to be playing back DV 480. So I have that right there. It's just kind of matching the preset that I've already made here. And then I'm going to select Next. And then it gives me all the information on it. And when I say Completed, I now have this. Now, when I'm ready to capture from tape in my source window, I can select this particular thing. And it's going to look down my firewire and look for the deck. And if there's a tape in it and it's receiving signal from it, then I'm ready to start capturing immediately or scrubbing through it. My preview device, right now all I have is generic OHCI output because I don't have one of the Grass Valley solutions in here. But if I had something in here like the HD Storm or uh, HD Storm Elite or something of that nature, it would also be listed here and I could pick that to have my audio and video output there. As far as importer and exporter goes, I'm just going to kind of just come through these very quickly so you can see that each one of these has options that has to do with each one of these formats. So if I open up K2, am I getting it from a browser? Am I getting it from an FTP server, MPEG? All these different things. It's just a way of me being able to tweak each one of the codecs that's coming in. Underneath effects, uh, we do have the After Effects plugin bridge. You go onto the Grass Valley website, you can find a list of tested effects. Now, what this is, is basically if you have a plugin for After Effects, if it has been tested and works, you can actually take that third party plugin for After Effects and plug it directly into Edius and use it on the Edius timeline instead of having to go out to After Effects to place that effect on it and then bring it back in again. GPU effects, this is just a very large 3D library of effects that Edius has. And in here, you can decide what kind of multi-sampling you want to do, what kind of render quality you want to have. It also explains to you right here what your video card is and everything. And then your VST plugin bridge. This is basically for your audio. Edius should be able to bring in all compliant VST plugins. So if you have some favorite audio plugins that you want to be able to use that are VST plugins, you can use those. And last but not least on the system is the input controller. In other words, if you have a fader or if you have a jog uh, shuttle device, this is where you would set that up to be able to work with EDIUS and, and make it work correctly. And that's our uh, system settings.